Welcome. And before we start, um, if you have your ring on your cell phone, please silence it. But don't, don't let that stop you from tweeting, because we've got a very, very energetic uh, Twitter stream going here with, I guess, thousands of people tweeting right now. Um, my name is Kathy Davidson, and I'm a professor here at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, uh, co-founder of Haystack and director of Haystack at CUNY, and of the Futures Initiative. Today's event is jointly being sponsored by the Futures Initiative at the Graduate Center and the Haystack Hubs here and at Duke University's PhD Lab in Digital Knowledge. On behalf of all of us, I extend a hearty welcome to those sitting here in the English Department Lounge at the Graduate Center and those of you in virtual locations participating all over the world, from the University of Victoria in British Columbia, Canada, to CLAEH University in Montevideo, Uruguay, and also points east and west. Because we are on a very tight schedule, I cannot thank and name everyone who has supported today's event, but I quickly wish to thank Executive Officer of the English Department, Mario De Ganji, for hosting us physically, and everyone at the GC who has made this possible. Calais Westerling did the wonderful signage and is responsible for our live cast today, which is going to go just fine, Calais. <laughs> Lisa Taliaferri produced our FI uh, newsletter, Michael Dorsch and Danica Savani, I feel like NPR, Savani did <laughs> technology, click and clack, here we come, technology and project management. Laura Melendez is our producer and our new deputy director, Katina Rogers, joined us on Monday and jumped right into a leadership role. It's an amazing collaborative effort and thank you all. You can read biographies of our five panelists on the various websites for today's events. They will each be talking for about 10 minutes and highlighting what they will be able to do or in the, are in the process of doing in a dissertation that goes far beyond text. We have also asked them to comment briefly on the institutional process by which their work was approved or is being approved. Some of the people who are currently dissertating may not address that, that issue. Uh, we have created an open public Google Doc to which they have contributed details of their own success stories and to which anyone else in the world can contribute their own stories. Um, the information is on the podium in front of us. This is not just a panel today, it's a movement. Others can use these stories as models to build on. After the event is over, we'll be developing a website and we'll be sharing our information with various graduate school credentialing agencies, university administrator, heads of professional organizations, many of whom have already been pioneers in promoting the digital dissertation. We will also be collaborating with the Graduate Center's Digital Fellows, who have created a great resource on this topic, and with Haystack's Digital Dissertation Group. Please let us know if you know other programs we should be linking to. As with any peer-to-peer -peer programming, the whole is always greater than the sum of its parts. The point of focusing on changing the dissertation in form, style, substance, method, and media is that you cannot change a process unless you change the final product. Conversely, you cannot change a product unless you change the process. Institu institutional change must be systemic and continuous and be thought all at once. That said, institutional change is always uneven. So to make institutional change, you celebrate victories where you find them. You celebrate the success of any and every institutional transformation and use those as models for further trans transformation. We're hoping all the technology works today and that you're able to follow along on the live stream if you're not here in person. However, we are in Midtown Manhattan, right across from the Empire State Building, and sometimes the internet fails here. All our panelists know how to improvise if bandwidth fails us. We've reminded all of our virtual uh, members and participants today that should the live cast fail, they should use their human contacts to have a productive discussion and tweet that out and add to the fruit of our labors to our various open public Google Docs that will be accepting questions and comments. We'll be doing the same from here. We're working mightily so that hashtag remix the, di remix the dis doesn't have to become hashtag dis the remix. But even <laughs> if there is an epic technological fail, which is always possible, there does not have to be an epic human fail. We'll capture everything for use later, including anything that doesn't transmit. In other words, the technology may fail, but our creative, imaginative activist network is not going to fail. We'll be going alphabetically today, starting with Jay Davis, Communications, University of North Carolina, Dwayne Dixon, Cultural Anthropology, Duke University, Gregory Donovan, Communication and Media Studies, Fordham University, with a PhD from the Graduate Center, 
Amanda LaCastro, Le English, also from the Graduate Center, and Nick Susanis, Teachers College, Columbia University. You are in for a treat. These are five of the boldest, most imaginative, most brilliant, most creative, and courageous scholars you'll find anywhere in any discipline. No pressure. They will share their work with you, and then instead of going into a conventional Q&A, we're going to be doing a collaborative, interactive exercise called Think, Pair, Share. You should have all, maybe not all, because this is a bigger group than we were expecting, 50 of you will have pencils and pen, uh, paper. Anyone else should just get out a pencil and pen because we're going to be doing an interactive um, exercise called Think, Pair, Share and go into the questions from that. If you have a laptop, you can use a Google to share your ideas um, with the larger world. Tatina will be reading from the Google Doc um, in the Q&A period. But for now, we're going to get started with Jay Davis and then everybody else in turn. Please join me in welcoming these very, very courageous and wonderful participants. <laughs> Of us. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about my dissertation. Um, it's, I'm one of the people that is in process, and I can talk a little bit about what I've done to get it approved and why it worked for me. Um, I'm Jade Davis. I am a doctoral student. Am I too quiet? Okay. I'm a doctoral student in the Department of Community. Oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> The first one always has to make the adjustments. I mean, so this is okay. Um, I'm a doctoral student in the Department of Communication Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I'm primarily a media studies scholar, um, but I also say that I'm a performance studies scholar. One of the reasons I'm able to do this is because in my discipline, there's a bunch of different subdisciplines, and performance is the one that lets me do the digital thing in a way that I find meaningful because it's about creating organic experiences, looking at everyday life, and trying to push narratives. Um, and that's sort of what my dissertation is doing, um, but more in a media sphere. Um, the picture you see on the screen um, is a picture that was posted to a Tumblr site that I've linked to, um, which is where my dissertation was born. Um, that's actually my grandmother with her grandmother and a family friend on a trip to Washington, DC. Um, it's a photograph that I found when I went to take her to the hospital when she was going through an illness in her bedroom. And I brought it to her in the hospital, and I took a picture of it with my phone, and I sent it to my aunt, and I posted it to my Tumblr site, which I'll go to in a little bit. Um, and it was just one of those moments where I finally, like on a very personal level, understood what was so different about digital media for me versus analog media, which is one of the questions that I'm um, asking. Um, there's a different level of access and distribution that's, that's completely different than having a tangible thing that you have to go to places to see. And when you think about how we're interacting with media now, um, more often than not, we're taking in information through these devices, um, and we're doing it in what I like to call like low-res knowledge production, meaning that when we look at printed stuff, there's 300 DPI, meaning there's 300 dots per inch of an image. But for the screen, there's 72 dots per inch. And it goes quickly. Um, I use Tumblr because I love social media. Everything tends to have its own metaphor in it. Tumblr is tumbling information. Um, I tend to be a secondary adopter, meaning that I adopt it after it looks like it's going to be successful, but usually before it's bought, um, which is really important because I'm a media ecologist and I want to sort of go through the process with the platform. Um, and when I do that, organically like a performance, you tend to learn lots of things. Um, one of the things that I learned through doing this is that people are interested in consuming information in this method. The map that you see at the bottom um, is from Google Analytics, which is Google's tool that they have on almost every website you go to that measures where people are coming from, how long they're staying. Um, and what's been really amazing about having a digital project for me um, is most of the time when you're in the process of writing a dissertation, you don't know if anybody's going to be interested in what you're talking about, if anybody's going to see it, if anybody's going to read it. Um, I have 2,000 people who organically followed me on my Tumblr site. Um, I've never advertised it. Um, there's been 31,000 visits from people from around the world um, from a total of 192 countries. In addition, it's something that I was able to share with my grandmother, who is sort of my bouncing ground for ideas. I know that I'm doing something that makes sense if she understands it because she's really, really smart. She's smarter than my grandfather, but she dislikes technology. 
And the first time I showed her the site, she totally got it. Um, and she's not the only one. Um, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with Tumblr. I will go to the Tumblr site now. Oh no. The problem of going first. Um, so this is my Tumblr site um, at vintageblackbeauty.com. Um, and I call it an archive remixing project, um, meaning that I go to archives with lots of photographs that people might not know about unless you're going to archives looking for photographs. Um, I then post them to the Tumblr site and link back to the archive. Um, I've done ebbs and flows of activity just to see what happens because that's one of my points of information um, that I'm using to analyze my dissertation. Um, and it's been really fun and interesting because again, there's 2,000 people who follow this. So there's 2,000 people for every picture that's posted that are potentially going to see it. Um, but I get data like this picture was seen by a bunch of people and there's only three notes. Um, and I think that these are meaningful things to just know and think about when we think about what's happening with knowledge. Um, I've gone on the record in the past saying that we continue to use the book as the prism for knowledge um, just because that's what we've had. Um, most of us are told that we need to write um, a monograph. Um, that's the model that makes sense to us. Libraries are full of books. But when you think about how we consume information and how often we're learning new things, um, most of us learn things. I'm going to ask how many people here are on Twitter or Facebook, Tumblr, do Tumblr users, Pinterest. Did anybody not raise their hand for anything? <laughs> one person, two people. <laughs> so I'm sure that everybody's had an experience on one of those sites where they saw something that was insightful that sort of changed how they were thinking about something. Um, but that's a very different model than learning something in a book. It requires a different type of analysis, a different type of critique. Um, and I don't, for me personally, I know that I won't understand that by just writing. Um, I need to go out and do something. And that's sort of what this project has been. Um, I said I would talk a little bit about the approval process. Um, so there are two very important things. I already said one of them. Um, one is that I'm in performance studies. Um, but the secondary thing is that my advisor, Kim Hillis, is Canadian. Um, this is important because Canadians love McLuhan, and I do too now. Um, so I took a class with him, and at one point we were reading the essential McLuhan, and we were reading the media and this the message, um, the general canonical works that people tend to read from McLuhan, and he brought in a book, and it was this book, The Medium is the Massage. How many of you have seen The Medium is the Massage? A couple. Whenever I cite this book, people tell me it's a typo. But it's not. It's not a typo. It is supposed to be the massage. And the reason this book is so important is because McLuhan is one of those people who we know is canonical in media studies. He has success. People have read him or they've heard quotes from him. They love him or hate him. But he was very much fighting against the idea of the book-making man, sort of a linear man that goes straight across time. And he wrote these books that are very graphical. Um, they look like websites. Um, they're small phrases that look like tweets in them. They actually fit his tweets. I tweet books a lot like this. Um, and it's playing with the format of the book. Um, so when I saw this book, in addition to being like, OK, I'm in performance studies. I can play and have fun. Um, I also asked my advisor if I could write something that looked like this. And I brought it to all of my committee members and asked, is it possible to do something like this but try to make it web-based? And they said yes. Um, and I think that's really important because in most disciplines or most subject matters, there are people out there who are doing things that are different and innovative. It's just an issue of going out and asking people, what are you doing? How did you get to do that? Um, which is why I'm really excited to hear everybody here that's going to speak. Um, and I'm excited to have so many virtual participants. Um, and in terms of closing, um, I think that for me, one of the things that's been really interesting with all of this and sort of the move to digital dissertations is how we conceptualize the idea of archives. Um, it's one of those things that's central to many disciplines, but it's something that, again, it's one of those things that contains its own metaphors. Um, and pictures are archival data, um, and they're consumed just like everything else through a screen. So what I'm hoping will happen with everybody that's talking here, and I think we're going to see this, is that we think of different ways to conceptualize what you can do with a screen presentation. Um, most of us create our documents on computers, so they start to a screen, they start on a screen to a certain extent. Um, but also, how can we push the limits of paper, which is something else we're going to see. Which is, and with that, I will 
has to be good. So <laughs> I'm so happy to follow Jade because Tar Heels lead the way, North Carolina <laughs> represent. <laughs> Um, so I'm from up the road from Jade. My name is Dwayne Dixon and I'm from Duke University. I just defended my dissertation in May um, in the Department of Cultural Anthropology at Duke. So my project is one on um, the ethnography of young people in contemporary Japan, specifically Tokyo. And I'm going to just start with a brief overview of the project, that, my research project, because it's critical to understanding then the translation to form. So I studied three groups of young people, uh, Kikoko Shijo, which are returnee kids, so young people that have lived abroad, typically because their parents are middle class or upper class, managers, professional people. The kids have lived in another country and typically gone to an English language international school, but possibly a local school. They're always bilingual, if not tri or qualingual, and then they return back to Japan, which is when they get the moniker Kikoko Shijo, which literally is return to the country child, so kids that have come back. So their I, Japanese identity is suspect and it's also excessive. So they have a lot of stuff going on just linguistically, but also culturally. Um, the other group of young people that I studied are Japanese skateboarders, which are almost exclusively young boys and men and largely working class, and then finally cultural workers. So this is a pretty broad category of contingent labor, primarily stylists, photographers, web designers, um, translators, but none of them in some sort of permanent position, sort of pulled to the core of advertising agencies, large corporate projects, and then maybe work for a period of time and then spun off. And again, these are all young people from 18 into their 20s, early 30s. Some of them have studied abroad uh, to get their sort of technical training and then returned to Japan, to Tokyo. But again, they're often in a kind of liminal or unstable position for various reasons, but economic is their primary um, vulnerability. So this is, um, yeah, so this is an archival image just kind of leading us into thinking about text and Japan and this kind of structuring of young people. This is an image from kids practicing their kanji strokes in, uh, in school. So this is um, a way for us to also think about space, which is one of the, the other main focuses or foci of the project. So these young people show up in specific spatial locations, schools for the Kikokushijo, the returning kids, the streets, obviously for skaters, and then in, in a space that's kind of a non-space, right? The kind of global imaginary that the cultural producers, workers are actively creating. So this is Mami. She's one of the Kikokushijo returning kids. She lived in LA. So her, her orientation is very much away from Japan and outwards through media practice. Skaters are very interested in clearly in body practice, but also in the relationship between media. As you can see, Koji, who's actually Costa Rican Japanese, filming Itoshin, who's a high school dropout, but one of Japan's top skate pros. And they're filming a, a pro video that then their, their company is going to release. And this is a window display made by one of my cultural worker subjects, Irina. And this is also a sample of her graphic design layout work. Um, so this project is really thinking, trying to re think about space at the local level, also trying to think Japan much more broadly as something that's oriented and connected to the Pacific Rim and then to urban centers beyond. Um, so in sort of in a sort of shorthand, it's about Japan. It's about challenging notions, structuring uh, ideas of Japan, Japan's history. It's also trying to challenge ideas of Japanese youth 
and youth at a particular time when they seem to be beset by both economic and social shifts and instabilities. So um, the form. So I use a lot of written text. I took a lot of field notes in a very traditional ethnographic mode. I also used a video camera. So these are mostly all stills, except for these two last slides of Irina's work. I used a, an ethnographic video approach as well. So what you've seen prior were all video stills pulled. So my dissertation has two modes, right? A written one and then a visual one, one that I produce. And then I also draw on archival footage to also think about Japanese kids, as well as popular film and written texts. So I have all these media forms that I'm trying to juggle, as well as multiple sites, right? Where there's lots of kids showing up in different ways, and they also have a lot of connections to one another. So the form is already, I think it already needs to have a kind of multivalent approach. Um, and I want to show you very quickly, let's see, or just have this play in the background, I guess, this video. So this is just ethnographic video that I put together of Itoshin, who, again, is one of Japan's top pros, but supports himself by working the night shift at a convenience store. So he's actually going to work. Um, so I needed a form that could hold all of this material and also allow it to talk or, or intersect with different parts, different components, and not be fragmented or laid out maybe in a kind of linear fashion. So I elected to use Scalar. So Scalar is an open source digital humanities publishing platform. That's its tagline. And um, it's developed at, out of USC. And Tara McPherson, who is the, sort of the, Lord, uh, the lead PI on it, um, was very generous in allowing me to use it when it was still in, a, in beta format. So I began playing with Scalar. I created an account. It's all online. And I began inserting text. So it's a very fluid and flexible form. It was able to hold both my media files and my written text. And I was, allowed, and I was able to create links that I didn't actually, wasn't able actually to do so well when I was writing. So I was also thinking theoretically about um, Guattari's notion of the machinic assemblage and also Benjamin's idea of the montage. So these were sort of theoretical turns that I was trying to incorporate as I was dealing with the lived accounts of these, of these kids in Japan. So I'm thinking about the form enacting the diverse connections of possibility that the young people um, are experiencing in contemporary Japan. And Scalar is allowing me to do lateral or horizon horizontal connections between different stories, but it's also allowing me to connect different theories, and different histories, and then to also incorporate analysis. So the way that I've structured it is that a reader can play across the surfaces of the dissertation. If they, all they want to watch is videos, they can actually pull all of those out. If they want to just read theory, they can check out my bona fides, and they can see all of my theory. Hopefully, they'll get sidetracked or derailed by something that I'm alluding to in one of those passages, and then sort of derive or detour into an ethnographic set. Then maybe they'll want to keep reading ethnography that then will hopefully pull them back maybe into sort of a review of maybe juvenile delinquency in 1930s Japan. So that hopefully the reader is actually starting to build new connections in their mind, probably ones that, hopefully ones that I didn't even intend or actually anticipate. But the way that the Scalar project is set up, it's able, able actually to permit a reader to move and navigate in ways that are somewhat unexpected. So this is... Um, this is just the front piece. This is only an excerpt of the larger navigational panel. You can actually change the views that a reader might encounter, a reader, user, player might encounter. So there's different ways to actually depict the information in the front, front piece. So this is the index, as it were. So this is, and again, this is just a snippet. And I, I prefer to see it laid out as a pathway, but you can do it as a radial or, or other formats. And you can go to Scalar and play around and look at these yourself. So I want to talk now about production and getting this through the institution or the bureaucracy itself. Um, so you know, it's cultural anthropology. We're tricksters. We do really well at sort of sliding in and sliding out of different places, thinking about Loki or in Japanese mythology, the kappa, these kind of figures that can inhabit other forms and then make them materialize in new ways. So when I proposed 
this doing the, my dissertation in Scalar to my committee, they were all for it. But they're a bunch of anthropologists, so that wasn't such a hard sell, I don't think. I was also fortunate to have a really open committee. But of course, I needed to get past the gatekeeping hurdle of the graduate school administration itself. And this is actually when the dean of the grad school at the time suggested that I simply look at the hard science model, where hard scientists do a written analysis, but they will link in their appendix to videos, say, of um, cell crawling videos, which is the example that the dean gave me. You can go Google that. So the, the data itself is in a video or some other media form that lives in the appendix. And then the scientist dissertator will then just submit a PDF. And that's what goes and passes through the graduate school. So I borrowed that form, and I simply wrote a long 30-page extended abstract, essentially, with the video stills that you just saw. I put all those in the PDF form. I format it just like a dissertation with a bibliography, and that's what I submitted to the graduate school. And in the appendix, it pins and arrows towards the scalar URL. So the PDF then goes and lives in a, a digital database, and then someone can access that, and then through that would find the scalar video, or scalar, sorry, scalar project, or they can simply Google and search the endless question, which is the name of my project, and it lives sort of in the open ecology of the web. Um, so I think that Scalar you know, allows me to generate these new connections. It's also because of the way Scalar is configured. If you open the settings, other users can link to your own work, and then you can also link to others. So in fact, people can be annotating your own work. Or like, for example, the video that I was showing you, someone might be able to actually use that in another project, say around young people in cities. And so they could actually link and harness that into their own scalar project. So I'm also trying to think about collaboration and the way, much in the way that Jade talked about Tumblr, trying to think about the way, not open sourcing as it were, as if it all comes back to maybe a single location, but something that proliferates out in all of these different ways and finds new formulations or new um, manifestations as people improvise with the knowledge that we're encountering. And again, this comes back to Jade's point, too, that the book is not, of course, the monograph is not this way that we frequently encounter knowledge. And maybe, in fact, I would like to ask that maybe this isn't the way that we're going to create new knowledges in the future. So yes, yeah, Scalar and this project in particular hopefully opens up to future proliferations. But there are also concerns that we need to think about, which are that digital is mutable and it's changeable, which are good things, but it can also be an unstable medium. So how, again, not to fetishize the archive, but how do these things get preserved? So this is a question that we also need to hopefully consider. Hopefully we'll, we'll talk about this when we move to the Q&A and the larger discussion. Um, but I think that Scalar as a whole, for me, it offered a possibility to make all these linkages and connections. And also, just as an aside, it's something that I'm incorporating into my pedagogy. So I use it with undergrads because of its possibility of being opened up for multiple inputs and for its capacity to hold lots of hyperlinks and media that's actually self-created, so audio and, and video files. So I also find it a very flexible and very user-friendly. You can do a lot more to it, but at its base level, sort of out of the box, it's also extremely user-friendly. So it doesn't require really much technical know-how or um, sense to start using it. It's very um, intuitive. So thanks, and I'm going to hand this over. All right, so what I'm going to present on today is a dissertation that I completed about a year and a half ago. So I'm going to go through both the process of constructing this dissertation here at the Graduate Center um, and some about the actual product that was produced through this process and how digital media was integrated into both of those uh, things. I did my PhD here in environmental psychology. I now teach in communication and media studies. So I'll also note that part of this project is possible because I operate in an interdisciplinary area. Um, my committee was particularly receptive to the idea of doing something new since I was pulling together uh, their expertise from very different disciplines in some cases. Um, I want to start with this visualization. 
Um, the title of my dissertation was MyDigitalFootprint.org. It's still the title. Um, and this is sort of what triggered the idea for me, is that back in about 2010, two researchers created an application called the iPhone Tracker. And what this application did is it recognized that there was a file on your iPhone stored locally called consolidated.db that tracked all of your movements by triangulating your signals across telecommunication towers. Right? So within a degree of accuracy, our movements throughout the day by having a cell phone turned on and on our bodies was tracking our data and sending that data to various third parties. Okay? The issue was that it was a mistake that this was stored locally on the phone. So when these researchers discovered this file and created a simple way to visualize your movements over time using OpenStreetMaps, Apple quickly released a security update that erased this local file. Right? So it in no way stopped the practice or changed the practice. It simply took the user, the person providing the data and the information, and further obscured their role in this rather complicated research relationship. Um, so this got me thinking that under this inf transnational informational capitalism, this sort of socioeconomic paradigm in which we live, that the medium is the method, doing a play on Marshall McLuhan's uh, notion of the medium is the message, um, that the media in which we engage in, particularly social media, is often proprietary. The process, the product, is owned and copywritten by someone, some corporation, or some government in a few cases. Um, and this means we're often enrolled in research without our consent. Even if we're checking a terms of use policy, this would never pass muster with an institutional review board as an appropriate consent form. Right? Yet we regularly check off these boxes that's treated as consent, and we are enrolled in processes of research that we may or may not agree with if we are even aware of it. Um, and these research relationships in particular are proprietary um, and hard to see. Uh, they're designed as such. You might think that because you do not pay a fee to Twitter uh, and you provide your personal data, that that is a fair trade, and that may be the case. But the fact that all of these entities in which we interact with, from credit cards, debit cards, uh, chain stores like Walgreens and Target to Twitter and Gmail, these databases get sold, merged, or even illegally combined at various places, in particular at data fusion centers that exist throughout the country. Um, so proprietary research relationships as something that all of us, but in my concern, particularly young people, are embedded in mm -hmm. was something that I was curious about uh, and how to change this, not only understand it, but how to change it and challenge it in some way through my dissertation research and project itself. Um, so the first iteration of MyDigitalFootprint.org was a recruitment site uh, to try and find young people ages 14 to 19 living here in New York City that were interested in talking about their daily engagements with proprietary research. I conducted 15 uh, unstructured, open-ended interviews that were roughly two hours each, uh, and simply to understand what these young people's everyday life was like and what their interests and concerns were as they engaged with things like Facebook, Twitter, Gmail, and so forth. Um, the primary thing that came out of this is that their main concern was that they had no functional understanding of how this media worked. They were highly dependent on Facebook, highly dependent on Twitter. It was everywhere in their life. Yet they had no idea how it generated revenue. They had no idea how it technically operated. And thus, questions such as, do you care about privacy? Are you concerned about your privacy? They may have said no, but that was crouched in a lack of understanding of what kind of research they were being enrolled in. So this became the focus of the project after this interview period. And I then reached out to five of those interviewees and hired them as co-researchers onto the research project. Right? Now, at this stage, this meant involving them both as co-researchers but also as media producers because we had agreed that we were going to develop our own open source social network so as to take the typical consumer of social networks and making them a producer to get some understanding of the production that goes on and the research that they are frequently entailed in. Uh, this also meant that in, our, in my institutional review board application, I had to actually add them as research personnel, right? which was in and of itself its own process. I had to put them through qualitative research training as well as media training in order to get them on the application approved by the institutional review board so that they could work with me to continue the research process, not only to build the social network, but to conduct new sets of interviews. Um, as we began producing the social network, we had no ultimate goal. This was not to create an anti-Facebook 
or new Facebook. It was simply to see what happens when we engage in the production of media that we are regular consumers of, and how does this change our understandings of privacy, property, security, and the politics of the research that we are enrolled in. I'm just going to quickly highlight two points of this research and design process that allow for reflexive analysis uh, through digital media design. One was the .po file that comes along with BuddyPress and WordPress. Okay, so we used a content management system, WordPress, that was open source, along with the BuddyPress plugin that adds social networking features. The .po file is what allows for multiple languages to be possible when you use any kind of interface. So someone can select from a drop-down list French, German, Spanish, English, whatever they want. Uh, for us, we decided to look at the language embedded in this interface and create our own language that met our own values and the words that we wanted to use. And this was important in a number of ways. Not only that we personalized the language and the terms that young people preferred to use, but when we came across things like private messaging, right, which was a term that was part of the interface for a feature that allowed for one-to-one -one private messaging. At this stage, the young people were seeing on the back end, at an administrative level, the kind of data that flows through their network and the fact that these messages were not private, that they could see the supposedly private messages that users of this social network were sending to each other meant we probably shouldn't call this private messaging. It is misleading and it lulls people into this idea that their messages are somehow secret and not public to a number of people. So we changed that to public messaging. There were many instances of this sort of reflexive analysis once we got into the nitty gritty of deciding what the interface should say and how it should look. Another thing was to comply with the Institutional Review Board, we had to create a consent form. Okay, because we were inviting young people to come fill out uh, social profiles about their experiences with the internet. Uh, and thus this was essentially a survey or an interview that we were doing online. Uh, the sent form had to be about a page in length, readable by a seventh grader, and clearly articulate what was being done with their data, why, what their rights were as a participant. So what you see on the left is what we ended up with as an assent form or a terms of participation for our social network, and compared to Facebook's terms of service, which is a 50-page legalese contract, right? Ours was roughly 450 words. Facebook is roughly 4,500 words. Okay, so this is a comparison in which you were designed to not know or understand the kind of research that you are enrolled in. Um, this resulted in an actual social network, which is now archived. It only existed for the period of time that the IRB application was live. Um, the dissertation itself that came out of this was a printed uh, physical copy, yet you'll notice that the title itself is mydigitalfootprint.org. This was notable because my database had, sorry, my dissertation had to go into databases like ProQuest, which would embargo my dissertation and force people to pay for it if they wanted to access it within a period of time. Well, if you look at the title and just plug the URL into your browser, you'll get the free PDF of the dissertation. So it's a way of further circulating the dissertation itself. And I also use, with the help of the Graduate Center's librarians, um, a Creative Commons copyright. So I made it explicitly clear that anyone is able to share and recirculate the dissertation as they see fit. And then the dissertation itself became archived in the final version of this website, mydigitalfootprint.org, which includes interactive methodological timelines, uh, the PDF of the dissertation itself. Uh, the defense was open to the public and live streamed here at the Graduate Center, as well as live tweeted while it was happening. Amanda beautifully did a storify of GTD dis. Um, so this now becomes sort of a public media archive of the dissertation process itself and the various products that came out of it. Thank you. Hello. So we did not get PowerPoint fatigue. I have a Prezi if I can find it on Jade's computer here. Okay, hello. So first I would like to thank Kathy Davidson for inviting me to be a part of this panel. 
as well as the organizing committee and our participating partners for making this possible. My name is Amanda LaCastro, and I'm the only doctoral candidate on the panel who is a student here in this very room, which houses the English program here at the Graduate Center. This is a unique program, one with a history of innovative and inter interdisciplinary scholarship that continues to support pioneering research at both the programmatic and administrative levels. Today, I will share my experience working in the system, including the roadblocks, failures, and triumphs that I've encountered along the way. So why here and why now? I came to the Graduate Center because an alumnus pointed me towards the Interactive Technology and Pedagogy program. When looking for a PhD program, I knew I wanted to study the intersection between educational technology and pedagogy, especially the writing process. But in 2009, very few programs had invested in the digital humanities and as many critics have noticed, the digital humanities weren't particularly concerned with pedagogy. So at MLA that, th that year, sorry, at MLA in 2009, I saw Matt Gold present Looking for Whitman, his collaborative cross-campus teaching experiment run on WordPress. And after speaking with Matt at that conference, I was pretty convinced that CUNY could support the kind of work that I wanted to pursue. In my four years here at the Graduate Center, I have seen the Digital Humanities program grow from budding to burgeoning, with several institutional initiatives in place to support digital work. But it is clear to me now that this trajectory has been built on years of innovative approaches to humanities research, such as those collected in our Remix the Disc mm -hmm. campaign, which we've had over the past month. And please go to this Google Doc and add your dissertation if you're doing non-traditional work. Some of these examples are even here from the Graduate Center, such as Katherine Harris and Jeff Druin. In my coursework here at the Graduate Center, I've been encouraged to experiment with digital methods. I have TEI encoded Emily Dickinson poems. I have done a distant reading of prefaces in 18th century novels. And I developed an online academic genealogy project with my classmates, which evolved into a full-scale digital project, The Writing Studies Tree through the work of Ben Miller, Jill Belli, myself, and our faculty and student consultants, this just won its third digital innovation grant from the provost here at the Graduate Center. Meanwhile, my coursework and my oral exams exposed me to new media and composition theory that I needed to argue for the relevance of this work. The combination of theory and practice not only gave me the tools to formulate my dissertation project, it also helped me secure an instructional technology fellowship which is a key turning point in my academic career. So now for the details. Here is the what, why, and how of my dissertation project. As a fellow, I work to help professors across the disciplines integrate technology in pedagogically sound ways. For over a decade, this program, the Macaulay Honors Program, has maintained a multi-user WordPress install, similar to the one that Greg was just talking about, and it's also similar to the CUNY Academic Commons or the MLA Commons that you might be familiar with. However, the primary purpose is to support the creation of course sites and student-run blogs. I am using the archive of over 3,000 Macaulay ePortfolio sites as the data for my dissertation in order to investigate student writing in online open spaces. My goal is to challenge the assertions we make about the, both the benefits and the drawbacks of public writing by providing evidence from this case study through a mixed method approach, including surveys and interviews with the students, as well as a distant reading of all 3,000 sites and a close reading of six student-run sites. And this, is bet uh, this was Greg's <laughs> point. Greg, you'll like this one. <laughs> In order to deal with this large data project, I had to first strip out any of the sites or posts that were marked private from the data, and I had to create a simple consent form like the one Greg described, which is very different than the complicated user agreements like Facebook's that we're used to. Since this is not a typical dissertation project, especially in the humanities, my IRB process was extremely complicated and took over four months to complete. Although the sites are public, it is important to remember that the data I'm using does reveal identifying information about the students. This process led me to grapple with many of the difficult ethical questions about using public online materials. 
But fortunately, the Graduate Center established the internet research team filled with faculty and students who are dealing with these same issues in their research. And they were a wonderful resource for me as I was dealing with these questions. So here's where I get technical. So thank you, Greg, for getting a little technical before me. The first phase of my dissertation research was the surveys. In fact, it was the internet research team that led me to use Opinio, which is a secure software incoming freshman. This is one of the many ways in which collaborating and cons in fact, it was the internet research team that led Opinio, which is many ways in which Clen consulting with researchers outside my discipline has strengthened my scholarship. And it is also why it is important for our institutions to provide us access to these kinds of tools. Through these surveys, I found that about 30% of Macaulay freshmen had composed on a blog before entering college. And if they did, it was through an English course or school newspaper, not a personal site. However, almost all of the students are on one, more than one social networking site and therefore are actively writing in online open spaces. The second phase of my dissertation is a distant reading of the course sites. And this is the stage I'm currently engaged in. This process of dealing with the data is new to me, but my ability to deal with these challenging tasks comes from both my experience on my other digital projects and through the help and collaboration with my peers, especially Mickey Kaufman in the history department. The data from the ePortfolio sites is in MySQL, which you can see on the far left there. It's a database system that runs on my server, and I process it through selecting segments as test cases. So yes, this means I'm learning to code, or more specifically, to write scripts. And for example, the raw data, which you can see in that first slide, uh, is from one Arts in New York City course. It's actually from Sandra Pearl's Arts in New York City course at Macaulay, and it is very, very messy. So the first step is to extract the relevant information and get rid of anything that will distort my results. So after I pare that down, I create these relationship tables and begin to play with my data. So in the example you see here, I'm using topic modeling to see what words students use in proximity to the word art in their posts. I've used the same data to look at other metrics such as how often the students posted, the average length of their post, and compared the relationship between the length and frequency of posts. These experiments usually start with a sketch pad and paper to work through the data itself. It is both fun, I'm playing with my data, and frustrating, because I end up with dozens of these spreadsheets. But the results can be pretty beautiful. I have taken this grammatically incorrect caption from a popular subreddit of people who play with data, but the visualization you see is the result of my topic modeling. And I can explain a little bit more about that, but I'm running out of time. <laughs> this is all a learning process which takes trial and error. And I never know what the results will be when I start working on a new data set. But so far, the journey has been as fruitful as the preliminary results. The next phase of my dissertation will be to interview the winners of Macaulay's ePortfolio Expo and to close read their winning submissions in order to identify the areas of learning transfer between the faculty-led sites and the student-directed sites. All three stages of my research include various types of media, as everyone was saying. I've got videos, data visualizations, infographics, screenshots, and live links. So it's hard to represent on paper, and I'm constantly reimagining what the final product will look like. From the beginning, I have been blogging my way through this process in order to provide a model for other scholars who want to engage in these methods, but also to promote an open, transparent approach to academic work. My philosophy is to, as Kathleen Fitzpatrick famously wrote, do the risky thing. Actually, when one of my prospectus reviewers wrote that he had never seen a dissertation like this before. But thanks to the endless support of my committee, Matt Gold, Sandra Pearl, and David Greetham, and now Kathy Davidson, I'm pursuing, pursuing the project I dreamed of back in 2009. And I see this ethos of risk-taking catching on here at the GC, as is evident by the amazing work of my fellow grant winners, and especially the dissertations of English students like Jesse Morandi, who's working on a Walt Whitman video game, Ben Miller, who's doing a distant reading of dissertations, and Jeff Binder's project, The Distance Machine. All of this is happening in humanities departments worldwide, and I believe, as Jesse Strommel suggests in the online journal Hybrid Pedagogy, we can view the dissertation as a learning opportunity, and it will make more room for these experimental approaches, and hopefully create useful products, rather than just the dusty, bound manuscripts that sit on shelves, or worse, behind paywalls. Thank you.
While we're warming up here, um, I'm going to thank Professor Davidson and the whole team for putting on a really, it's been a really great event, and all of you for coming. Actually, I want to thank you, Kathy, for putting, supporting this project for the last several years. Um, it's meant a lot. Um, still while we're getting this set, I see it. Um, my name is Nick Susanis. I just finished my doctorate at Teachers College, uh, Columbia University in education, and um, as you'll see, I did it in comics form, and I'll talk about that. Uh, so the question I started with was not why do it in comics, but why not do it in comics? Um, I was already doing uh, complex, accessible work in comics form, and we've already seen examples from uh, Art Spiegelman's Mouse to Scott McCloud's uh, understanding comics, so I figured the argument was done. I didn't need to come to school to prove I could do it. I could just start doing it. But, as you guys know, academia tends to move slow, and it can be narrow. So the project, uh, you know, I saw the political side of this project and realized that it had to both be directly about itself and be metaphorically about the context that it was done in. So I'm not going to talk so much about the specifics of how comics work, which would really tie into these first two projects. I was really excited about that. Um, but, but I will tell about the, the general idea of unflattening. Um, and so by flatness, I mean uh, a narrowing of our sight, a contraction of possibilities. And I, I like Herbert Marcuse's uh, his phrasing of it, a pattern of a pa conforming to a pattern of one-dimensional thought and behavior. And I connect that to flat land, Edwin Abbott's 1880s uh, critique of Victorian society, which uh, is about the geometric inhabitants of a two-dimensional world. And they're able to move east and west and south and north, but they have no concept of upwards. And you can see, you know, you can picture that here. They have no concept of what it means to come off the plane. And you can say, well, that's kind of silly, and obviously there's an upwards. But what is upwards for you and me? I mean, that's, it's a lot harder to see what our own, how to step off our plane. And I think the boxes of, of, that learning is being put into, um, boxes of space, boxes of time, boxes of subject, boxes of discipline, I think those are boxes we tend to put on ourselves. And, and as a result, it makes, it makes it hard to see things. It limits the way we see because we're in, we're in narrow spaces that, 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 that prevent us from seeing things around us. And so part of the, the big question here is, you know, what can we see when we bring in more things? Which brings me to my dog. And I'll say, if you have a chance to put your dog in your dissertation, I highly recommend it. I wouldn't miss it. Um, and so if you think about a dog's sense of smell, it's not simply stronger than yours and mine, but it's more nuanced. It's able to sense more layers and really sort of layers of time. So the dog enters this room. It knows what, who was here yesterday and the day before, and it has, a, it has this whole time capsule. So it's ex ex accessing, ugh, accessing dimensions of experience that you and I don't have access to. It's got upwards that we don't know. So when we think about you know, moving beyond the cycloptic, things have, things have sides. We know that we can turn them over and we can move around them. And I think this makes it possible for us to step out, to sort of step out of the situations we're in and maybe get some perspective on what it is we've been, been sort of confined by and, 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 um, and sort of see the artificiality of the boundaries that, that we construct ourselves. And so sort of speaking of artificial boundaries, um, I have, uh, the, the dissertation was about 130 some drawn pages long. And I have one page that looks like this, that looks like what dissertations are supposed to look like. I got my fonts right. I got my uh, spacing right. Um, and this page, very specifically, um, uh, this, this page talks about uh, Plato and, and Descartes and their dismissal of the senses and Plato calling uh, images shadows of shadows. So it's the one place in the dissertation where I turn to the reader and say, this is what I'm doing. I break the fourth wall and I'm like, this is what I'm doing, ha. And so we asked about what things get uh, when you turn things into the office of doctoral studies. So like I said, there's 130 some pages of comics. I got feedback on precisely one page. Yes, <laughs> precisely one page. The only thing they cared about is that I hit the margins, one and a half, by, which I hit the margins. wasn't that hard to do. Um, but on this page, as you'll notice, I tried to make it look like, <coughs> so there's figure one. I got feedback that says, on page 47, you have a figure. You don't have a list of figures at the beginning, so you need to have a list of figures <laughs> and put figure one on that, which... 
you know, I, I'd like to think that they were joking, but they weren't. I know that they're not joking, and 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 I wish I'd thought of it because it's so brilliant. Because here I am trying to sort of sort of needle what's going on, and I didn't think to put a list of figures. It would have been beyond me. Um, so there is a list of figures. It does include that image. <laughs> Fortunately, it doesn't include all the other pages because um, I'd still be doing it. Um, so. So, sort of to wrap this, it's a long, a long wrap of this, um, I want to talk a little bit about how the process uh, led me to things that I might not otherwise have gone to. Um, and, and I think the sort of general idea of this is, is that uh, to, to reverse the split of mind and body that I think Descartes put on us for all its benefits um, to get pushed back against its disadvantages, and to say that we're not really thinking machines. We don't, thinking isn't something that happens static. And for instance, when you draw, which is what I do, uh, when I make a mark or anyone drawing makes a mark, that mark is now visible outside of our heads, which means your visual system, which does an amazing amount of things every, all the time, it's doing all sorts of things, um, is now part of the system, which means you're having a collaboration between your ideas in your head and the marks on the paper, and those two are starting to talk together. And so... For me, I feel like as I start to sketch and I have words and I have pictures and I'm thinking in space and a lot of the non-linear, both of you guys talk, spoke a lot about, um, ideas start to come that I had no anticipation. I mean, I often say my comics are smarter than I am, and I totally believe it because I had this fantastic partner to work with, which was my sketches. Um, so I'm going to give you one very specific example uh, and, and take you through that. Uh, in the chapter on imagination, I, did, I wanted to do a page on stories. And specifically sort of the how stories can be a transformative thing. And, and I started, in, this is my notes from my 2011, some of the scribbles I made. Um, and I wanted to think about Scheherazade, because that seemed like her stories within stories really worked here. Um, and, and I started playing with it. And I, you know, so I had the idea that if you're familiar with the book Zoom or how, the film Powers of Ten, that I was going to have each, each of my images linked to another image, linked to another image. But in the midst of this, because I got half the idea kind of figured out, um, and also, I want to have it sort of snake in a reverse S or a Z to sort of Scheherazade across the page. Um, that uh, that in, by stories, I don't just want to talk about fanciful, but I want to talk about things like science. So if I'm writing this, I'm done. By stories, I don't just mean fanciful, I mean things like science. Okay, but here I am trying to... I, the, pictures, the pictures can't just be illustration. They have to be part of it. They have to show what I'm doing. They have to embody what I'm doing. So now I'm starting to sort of to think, like, what, what can I do? So I'm doing a lot of searching, and I'm thinking of the time the night stories were collected and the area that they were collected for. And I come across a, a, um, astronomers working in the Arab world who did some calculations that Copernicus later used, without any credit, um, to do his big move. And so now I'm really excited because earlier on, I'd had a page about Copernicus in which I basically, the short version of it is that I said, you know, even though nothing changed, he changed our perspective, which changed everything. So now all of a sudden I had this thing and it tied back to this thing I'd done already. And so I spent three weeks reading about this thing called the 2C couple and I'm learning the mathematics and the astronomy of it. And then at the same time, I'm trying to figure out how do these images play together? You know, how do they all resonate with each other? And, um, and so I'm going back and forth and back and forth between that and it continues and continues. And at some point what I end up with is essentially these, it's probably three square inches or something like that. Um, I, I had to teach myself astronomy, about, you know, the mathematics of that particular astronomy to condense it and make sense of it and make sense of it to a reader in a tiny space, which would you say that's kind of crazy. Why would you spend that much time on a thing? But it was awesome because I got to learn all this stuff because my art forced me to learn to research. And so I think that's the, the exciting part about bringing in these other modes and, bring, you know, and, and encouraging that, is that instead of research is sort of filling in that little last piece, and instead of sort of puzzling, instead of finding a piece to a puzzle, it, it's a generative thing that opens spaces for me. And my, my advisor, Ruth Vins, really encouraged me uh, to think about research as a journey. And um, I was fortunate enough. Uh, to work with Maxine Green, who some of you would know as professor of aesthetic education who passed away a few weeks after my defense, who really encourages the idea of imagination and arts is part of it. And I think when, by me sort of accepting that and, and making that my work from the beginning, 
Um, yeah, the dissertation was a blast. I don't know that people can say that a lot, um, but I had I had the best time. You know, I think my research and my specifically the dissertation is I don't want to say vacation. That's the wrong word, but um, but it's a lot of fun because I get to follow my thinking and see where it takes me, not not be stuck into any box, but find out what it is I'm thinking about. And um, so it's really a wonderful experience and something I really hope I can help. You know, with conversations like this. But other people figure out, you know, what modes do we work in? How do we think best? Um, and let's encourage that to be part of the conversation. So thank you. Well, I don't think I was being hyperbolic when I said these are five of the most creative, interesting minds. Uh, and hands and sounds and visions, um, all of that together that I, I, I've encountered anywhere. Um, but before we go into a, nor a regular uh, Q&A, please take those little cards and pencils. And we're going to do a little uh, uh, ex interactive experiment. If you're watching the live stream at home, find a partner and do this. Um, the first part of this is just 90 seconds, literally 90 seconds. Just um, think about what you've heard and seen here for the last um, hour and 15 minutes and jot down, um, we're gonna, there's going to be several parts of this, but jot down three questions you have um, that you would like answered. We're going to record these later and we'll make a dialogue of it. But right now, just 90 seconds, really quickly, the three things most on your mind, most urgently on the mind, on your mind. Get back on the mic. Just kind of sketching it out. I don't know how you live stream silence. I feel like I should be moonwalking or doing yeah. something. <laughs> Tap dance. Yeah. Testing. Tap dance. Tap dancing? I can do that. <laughs> This vision of the whole internet being utterly silent right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a famous So mischievous. <laughs> right? It's like the Zen internet. <laughs> so now, take another 90 seconds. Turn to someone next to you. Read, a, Take turns and read out loud the three things on your card. And then come up with one thing. You might have to compromise. You might have to edit. One thing between you that we're going to put on the Google on a Google Doc that will then like go out there into the world and let people. So one thing that you want to ask these questioners, but that you also want to discuss in a larger world, and we'll turn it into the website and the dialogue. So please just take ninety seconds to talk to somebody near you and just read what you've written on your cards and talk it through and think of one thing. Yeah, that's, so that's why I have it. Uh, so we do have one specifically happening here. Yeah, it's like. I wish we were recording that. Well, we could just. I mean, no, I mean actually the act of like watching it. Yeah, yeah. Really? It's now. Have you seen that? It's better if it's insane. I have 54 new impressions. It's unbelievable. And Kelly's got this beautiful catalog thing. I had not seen this before. I have. I know what it's called. The tagline is just a Twitter tag. I mean, it's a real line. Yeah, but to actually capture a visual video recording of it actually is what I need to do. Yeah, you guys were talking about your audience. 
So I don't know if everyone has a laptop or a shared laptop, but if you do, if you could write that question down on a shared document. The document's going crazy. People all over are adding to this document. It's kind of amazing. Um, Oh, that's, you can wait. You should cut out my Like, you know, at the end of the you should be credited there. I'm just passing out. I just walk around. So, um, this little pedagogical thing we've just done, and some of you now have been on it, have been in, with me doing this like twice or three times this week alone, because we've been doing a lot of events. If this method is called Think, Pair, Share. I highly recommend it. I learned it from a second grade teacher, but it's also done mm -hmm. in medical school. And what's so great about it is it means that normally when there's a Q&A period, like three people dominate and often ask follow-up questions that are really, really long. And lots of people go home frustrated from the Q&A. One of the things, the great things, and you can use this in any class. I tend to use it at every in every class period, in every class I teach, sometimes at the beginning to recap what people learn from their readings the night before. Sometimes yeah, when the so class goes so dull in the middle of the class, sometimes at the end is a recap. It's great because whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, you can commit something very quickly to a card. It's not life or death. It's just quickly what's on your mind at that moment. And then you get to talk about it with somebody else. You actually get to think through. It's very dialogic. It's very platonic. But it also, I don't quite understand how it works. It's kind of magical. I've done it with 6,000 people in the uh, Philadelphia 76ers auditorium. Uh, I mean, uh, basketball arena. Um, something about committing something to paper first, even just so quickly, it, it only works if you do it for 90 seconds. So you, you don't make it be a, an object of fear. But something about doing that and then talking yeah, about it really lot. evens out the introvert extrovert thing. I highly recommend it as an interactive pedagogy that uses that ex extremely sophisticated technology of machine-made uh, paper and machine-made pencils. Um, it also works far better when you write it out than when you do it on the internet, because it displaces that idea of access and who does or doesn't have an internet, a laptop, et cetera, et cetera. Now, a couple of other things before we get to some of those questions, I hope you will share on the Google Doc. Nick Susanis has some free comics that he's willing to, pass, to give out, if, you, if anyone would like comics, I would take him up on that. They're beautiful. Um, questions? Uh, maybe in the pairs, read some of the questions you have. Yes. Susannis. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, I was interested in the, in the project and whether it, it looks at comics as a genre, as a medium, as such. Yeah. On the mental level, because obviously on the, on, on the optic level it does. So, uh, or it takes it as the departure point for the exploration of the themes that it actually looks at? Yeah, it does both. Okay. Um, and I uh, it was interested, I mean, I wish I'd talked a little bit more about the medium because it overlapped with the first two presenters a lot. Um, so there's a whole chapter devoted to talking about comics and how our thinking works in comics. So it looks a, a lot at how it works. But it's also because the sort of general metaphor about flatness comics sort of interact with that because comics are using multiple modes at the same time, both visual and verbal, but also sort of linear textual things, but uh, all at once visual things, which I think your scalar thing sort of spoke to. Um, so I examined that quite a bit and I expand a, a lot about how drawing works and perception works. Um, I just didn't talk about any of that. Does that answer? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. The second question we'll take will come from our uh, virtual audience. Maybe continue. To, can you read that? Sure. So, how do you talk about your projects with less sympathetic listeners, um, which may include <laughs> anyone from advisors to more traditional scholars in your field, or ProQuest enforcers, or an anybody? How do you how do you gloss that for other types of scholars? Do we need to repeat it? Or an anybody? How do you gloss that for other? No, it came through. I mean, I'll just say in my case, I didn't actually face a tremendous amount of opposition. I faced a lot of questions. People who didn't understand what I, what I might have been proposing the first time around or wanted more information. And I just kind of learned to go into all of these situations with sort of a, an arsenal of information ready to answer any question, uh, overly prepared, um, which helped me for the eventual defense. But 
that was sort of what I had to learn to do to deal with all these obstacles. And it made the, it was annoying and it took a lot of time, but it actually made the project much stronger uh, and my understanding of it much deeper. Um, so sort of being armed with as much facts and information as possible when you encounter an obstacle, you might realize it's often just questions that they're asking as opposed to really trying to stop you from doing it. Um, whether it was ProQuest, the library, IRB, my advisor, the committee, all that would be included, I'd say. Um, I guess from my perspective, um, early on, I was told a lot that what I was doing wasn't a form of knowledge production and wasn't scholarship. Um, so to combat that, what I do have is I have a written portion that's sort of like writing up a science dissertation that talks about the theory that's important for my project. Um, it talks about what I think it's doing, but then I said if I'm doing that, I have to do another digital component to balance it out so I feel better about it. Um, but basically just showing that you're capable of doing that thing that people expect you to do tends to get you really far, yeah. um, just so they don't think that you're just doing this because it's fun and it's easy, but I am actually having deep thoughts. And look, here's your wonderful paper that I can give you. No. Can I, yeah. Just, and this kind of ties back to the question I was just asked, is that part of my work, I explained, sort of, not explained, but sort of showed how I was doing while I was in the act of doing. So for the reader that doesn't know anything about how comics work or whatever, as they were reading along, they started to get ensconced in that in that world and they you know they could say oh this is how he's been doing it you could go backwards and forwards and kind of say that that's how it did its thing and oh yeah that's why it's smart if you didn't already believe that um, um one thing i can say is that early on at the graduate center someone told me to find people who support your work and hmm. then just kind of do what you want right <laughs> but the problem with that is that now that i'm looking at the job market right hmm. everyone wants writing samples and almost all of my writing is on digital uh, online journals and things where it's like here's a link <laughs> right but it doesn't really translate to paper very much so i do worry about that is that when people want to see a writing sample my dissertation's all digital, what do I give them? So that's something we can continue to think about, I think. Can I just pop in here, because um, this has happened with my students, and we actually, um, my students always publish some kind of a thing online in my classes, but we've started, uh, on Amazon, you can do a self-published book, so you can get a reprint that you can put, put people, it's all it is is a reprint of what is appearing online, but for those people, it makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And I think you said it was sometimes fear or lack of knowledge. Yeah. If they can read the same thing that's online, sometimes they find it much more plausible. I'm shocked at how often people will be very skeptical and they'll literally give them a self-published off print of something that's on the blog and they're fine. Then they're like, wow, this is really smart. This is this is hard. This is a real disciplinary thing. So I would encourage in this transitional period, make the translation. You know, if somebody wants something physical, it's not that hard to do a self-published work. And you'll, you do it like breathing. And it just, it calms. You're not doing it for you. You're doing it to make a point of translation and entry. It, it, I, I promise you it works. I, one thing I worry about a lot is people defeating themselves and... Um, being afraid to be risky, to, call, to quote Kathleen Fitzpatrick, being afraid to be risky and ending up doing something they hate or they're bored with because they think it's safe. And we know from all the research that nothing defeats you faster than doing something you're, you hate and are bored with, right? All the success rigid, uh, and business literature, for example, is all about passion and success and taking risks. If, if you're a comfortable taking risk is a good bargain. It actually works. So I just want to say, too, that I think that actually it's true in my case, and I would theorize or suspect it's true for all of us, we end up doing more work than a traditional dissertation. Yes. One of the questions that was showing up on the Google Docs was, what about all the extra technical, technical skills you have to teach yourself? I mean, you're learning technical skills, certainly, but also you're trying to think about formal issues. I mean, it, it's happening in multiple layers, and all of us bring different literatures and different ideas to handle that. For me, I, I anchored my, and this is also about legitimation, I anchored my project in surrealist ethnography from, French, from the French, basically. So I built my, my project on the ancestors, as it were, and that was part of my legitimation, right? That I validated myself by working out of a particular school or discipline, and maybe one that has fallen out of favor, but trying to reimagine and reinvigorate it with new tools and new possibilities, thinking that those ideas back then had all of these virtual uh, potentials that didn't have the context 
or the other conditions, the environment that was necessary to actually allow those things to, to manifest. So hopefully I'm doing that, but then also using those tools to open up new ways for other people to connect to them. But of course we do have to deal with gatekeeping and that was another question was how, specifically in my case, but this is true for all of us, how do we deal with those who are in the US system with ProQuest? So again, this is where we end up doing more work. So I did that 30 page extended abstract that looks like a dissertation, right? That's the page or your whole thing where they're reading yours to look at the form. Yeah. So we're actually mimicking, I mean, we're living inside those forms and we're hedging them and manipulating them. And then for my committee, I actually gave them a long form printout. I mean, a rough hewn PDF <laughs> of my dissertation. So it was 375 pages of text. And it was like, here it is. And then they could go see the scalar site as a supplemental because that was the way that they were more comfortable and it was easier for them to evaluate, I would say, right? They could read through it in a much more straightforward way while also recognizing I had done all this other labor that I'd really put my heart into. Nonetheless, they wanted or needed this PDF, right? Which I also understand. So in effect, there were three forms that I used to get through the process. Do you regret it? No. I mean, each one of those forms. <laughs> the reason I'm saying you... that is because it, it is harder work, but my sense is it was it's harder work because yeah. it's great. I mean, that's what you want. I mean, it should be an experiment too, yeah. right? Yeah. So yes. you know how to do the other things, and so doing them is part of the task, but it allows you to get somewhere else. Okay, so a face-to-face, -face, okay. Um, I have a question. Do you guys have any advice for people who are looking to enter um, experimental programs like this or, or apply for programs that allow for that type of experimentation? How important is a portfolio or something, you, yeah, especially if these tools don't even exist yet necessarily for what you're trying to, what you're eventually going to be achieving or this journey that's going to unfold? You can't see what that's going to look like. How can you look, uh, how can you find that or, or steer roughly towards something like that? Um. One of the things that I think is really important, um, or at least that was important for me, um, was looking at the work that undergraduate students were doing. When I was entering graduate school, um, my department has something called bridge classes because most of our undergraduates are um, production students that allow me to take experimental film classes and learn these skills. Um, and lots of departments have things like this where you get to the graduate level and suddenly we're just writing, um, but undergraduates get to do lots of fun things. Um, and usually when that happens, um, there are ways to do the fun things with the undergraduates, even if it's just as an elective. Um, additionally, I know for communication studies, um, there are lots of media studies that are sort of breaking off um, and just doing media stuff. And they're starting to add production to it. Um, and web stuff to it just because that's what people are doing. So it's out there and you generally don't need a big portfolio, but there's lots of wonderful free resources um, out there to teach you how to do things like code or how to read analytics or how to write SQL. Um, and those are always just fun to learn how to do because you can make cool things happen on the screen. And I swear at the GC, there's something happening every day. Yes. I mean, the calendar, Mac <laughs> Old um, yesterday showed us the calendar just for this month. I don't think there was a blank date on the calendar. It's kind of crazy how many different things are available for you to learn and dabble in and, and experience and build and build your own portfolio from these resources that are available. Not every place <laughs> by any means has this many opportunities, but many but, places do. And sometimes they're at the, uh, often they're in libraries. Right. Often people in libraries have had to deal with these issues in advance of uh, scholars and um, have had to learn things that they can, that, that are very happy to teach to scholars. That's certainly the case here as well. Uh, and I joke that I got into graduate school via Twitter, but in a way that's serious because if, if you follow the different universities that you're interested in and look to see if they have a maker's lab, look to see if they have a digital initiatives environment, look to see what kinds of programs they are founding, what kind of work is coming out of that. You saw in my uh, slides all the different grant winners and then also the different interactive technology and pedagogy projects. Like, If you follow these schools on Twitter and you follow students and the programs you're interested in, you'll find the people who are doing the work that you're interested in. And by going to conferences. I went to MLA the year that I was looking for PhD programs to find out who was doing this work. And I also went to the Digital Humanities Conference for the same purpose. So while it seems crazy to go to a conference before you're ever in graduate school, it, it led me here, which is really important for me.
And make sure you put that question on the Google Doc, because one thing we're going to do is make this a resource that we can share to help other people. So your question will help other people, and the way we answer it will help other people then to answer that question. Do we have another virtual question? Then we'll do another face-to-face. -face. Um, so a few people are asking about preservation and access. Um, what kinds of thinking have you had to do about how people will access your materials now and in the future? I have a couple more. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so one of the reasons really early on people said that my project couldn't count as scholarship was because of the inability to archive it. Um, it was on Tumblr at the time. Tumblr was not owned by Yahoo. Um, there were lots of API tools that existed that could pull the Tumblr, but once they got taken over by Yahoo in a very loving way, they got rid of the API tool. Um, and once I got to the point where I'm like, okay, I'm mostly done playing on the site. I'm not playing on it as often. I need to archive it somehow. I need to go download it. Um, I learned that the tool was gone, and I actually had to write Yahoo like a note saying, hey, I did this for my dissertation. Can you give this to me? Um, and I got a big giant zip file sent to me um, that I backed up on a bunch of different places. Um, but I know that, like for me, understanding the platform is extremely important. It's not just about the media. So I need to have the risk of losing everything there um, to understand what it means to work with proprietary tools to create knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that's why the McLuhan was really interesting to me because photographs are so, they're really great. We've changed how we look at photographs with digital tools. We all use digital photographs. We look at them on the screen. We share them in different ways. Um, but they can be printed into something like a book. Um, we're used to reading them in that way, too. We're literate in photographs in many different forms. Um, so I purposely chose something that I would be able to easily reproduce and archive as long as they let me do it in the right formats. Um, and yeah, hopefully Tumblr doesn't disappear, but I think that most digital things, even the open source ones that are designed to work with libraries, still have the question of what happens when the machine has its accident. Um, all of really everything has its own accident built into it. And I don't know that we necessarily have an answer for that for anything yet. So, I mean, I, I was also very interested in Scalar. When I heard Tara McPherson sort of make her pitch about Scalar at Duke, she talked about Scalar being designed so that you could extract the data and preserve it. So it would map all of the connections. You wouldn't be able to activate it if it was outside of Scalar, obviously, because the software isn't there. But the data would be there, so that could be preserved. And also that Scalar software is housed in servers across the, the world, actually. Not all those servers are updating all the time, but that meant if, so USC is the primary server cluster, if theirs went offline, the information could still live in these other sort of um, swarm or disaggregated uh, server houses. So that was also something critical, but again, the machines are not permanent and we're, everything is destabilized and constantly in process. So it's, it's an ongoing issue. I mean, for me, I'm a, I'm a hoarder and a digital hoarder. So I have many, many, versions of my project and all of the raw materials, you know, all the video files are all preserved. But the video I just showed you that lives in Scalar is actually housed on Vimeo, which is another beauty in Scalar, is that Scalar doesn't hold most of the media data. It lives elsewhere. So you're linking from online archives or from other platforms. But of course, those are mutable and, and unstable as well, right, as Jay just talked about. So it's a comp, we don't, there is no resolution. No archivists have you know, a golden bullet answer, silver bullet answer. Yeah. I, I would just add that in my case, uh, in using uh, open source software, it was, I mean, what's very important about that is everything goes into like CSS or PHP or HTML or XML, formats that can always be reproduced or I would imagine will always be able to be reproduced. So it makes archiving exceptionally easy, at least it did for me. Um, and then our library also here at the Grad Center recently set up Open an open access repository. Exactly. And so yes. they just sent me the proofs for my kind of website that sort of archives everything as it is now within their database. So even if my website is taken down or changed, the interactive version of that gets maintained and archived by the library here at the Graduate Center. So even if I use proprietary tools without open standards that would allow me to export it, that would still exist. So I think things like that are also being developed that help in these situations. And I'd like to add that really the Graduate Center, I wish Polly Thistlewaite was still here. I think she just left. But here at the Graduate Center, it was because students like Greg and myself and other people working this way, we simply asked the librarians, like, can we have an open access alternative to a ProQuest or a different kind of embargoed database? 
And also I had to ask them things like, how do I encrypt my data? And can I have a backup for that database? And where does, you know, where these things go? You kind of have to work with your librarians, make friends with them. They're really great resources and they will help you figure out the answers to some of these questions. Yeah. I could add one more really quick thing. Um, this is another, this is also one of my sticking points, just as thinking of the book as a prism for knowledge. Books deteriorate over time too. Like I don't know how many of you look at really old books, but they're very fragile things, but we assume that they have more permanence than the digital thing just because it's the thing that we've inherited. But there are so many books that were small prints that have been lost to history just because they weren't preserved properly. Um, so it's, it's not something new, it's just something that we have to think about differently when we think about how do we preserve digital things. Yeah, I often say I couldn't be a historian of the internet if I hadn't been a historian of the book. So most of, I wrote a book about um, the last information age, machine-made printing and machine-made paper, machine-made ink at the time of the American Revolution. None of the books <laughs> I was working with at that time, <laughs> thank you, none of the books I was working with at that time were in any Library of Congress catalog or in the early American imprints catalogs. They were uh, one-off pirated books that were completely obscure. And I was also interested in handwriting, so that was not... <laughs> uh, one, one last question, and then I think it's time for a reception, and you get to talk firsthand to these really remarkable people. So, so I think, so yes. And then it's you not a question so much as a comment, um, but I want to say, first of all, I think it's really exciting to see the culture of scholarship changing, and it's a wonderful, it's an embrace of that, but I want to say it's not only about how knowledge is constructed and created, which is the dissertation piece and the amazing shape and forms, but I want to talk about the defense, um, and, and so how knowledge is disseminated and defended and shared. So for me, and it's occasionally an urban man, and I think um, Chris. defenses have been open. But to have it live stream, that is great. So I want to compare it to you've done this dissertation for two or three or four years. You've worked for how many hours have you worked to complete your dissertation? And the defense is the pinnacle. And you have two, possibly two or three faculty members sitting with you, fully willing to flow through. Yeah. And it feels to me it's 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 a it's a it comes from a culture where you're kind of reading. But to me, I mean, the fact that you can live stream and tweet during your events, it shares the knowledge, it makes it accessible, and what is what is more, um, you know, what is more honoring of all of the hours of work than to share it with the public audience right when you're doing it. So I hope that this sets a standard for defenses, that we're not just changing how we do the dissertations or what we look at, but also how we Anyone want to? Okay. I mean, I'll just add that personally, having not only by live streaming it, I actually got some people involved in the discussion that were outside of the room. There were maybe 40 people in the room itself, but there was about another 50 people, I would say, that were live tweeting and watching the stream. And it's since been archived and put on my website, which for me as a researcher is really helpful because I had six people on my committee. They were all brilliant. It was like a 90 minute defense, which was fun and thrilling. And to go back and actually hear their feedback has helped me rewrite and develop my dissertation more, which is a period of time that a lot of people almost just black out the moment it ends. <laughs> and you lose all of that excellent feedback from brilliant people that are never going to give you that much time again in your career in that kind of setting, right? Where six people read your book and then just sit for an hour and a half and talk about it. It doesn't happen too often. So, yeah. So this as I've said, is not an event. It really is a movement. We had an astonishing amount of activity. I don't know, Callie, if you have any kind of numbers to share there, but we certainly have an image or a graphic that you can take a look at. It's not, we, we're tweeting it of how much interaction there was. 2,000 tweets. 2,000 tweets. That's pretty funny. That's great. Um, we're now going to have a virtual, I mean, an actual reception. I don't quite know how to do a virtual toast to the people who are not here, but, um, you know, go for it, everybody out there. Have fun, and huge, huge thanks to these amazing, amazing colleagues.